Hi there, and welcome to Enterprise Software Innovators, a show where top technology executives share how they innovate at scale. In each episode, enterprise leaders share how they're driving digital transformation and what they've learned along the way. I'm Evan Reiser, the CEO and founder of Abnormal Security. And I'm Sam Motamidi, a general partner at Greylock Partners. Today on the show, we'll bring you a conversation with Johnny Leroy, Chief Technology Officer at Granger. Granger is a Fortune 500 industrial supply company ensuring seamless operations for a broad range of customers, from hospitals to manufacturing plants and everything else in between. With over $16 billion of annual revenue and 26,000 employees, the company provides over 30 million products to support their 4.5 million customers. In this conversation, Johnny shares his thoughts on how AI transforms operations at Granger, quick wins for AI applications in the enterprise, and realistic expectations around today's AI capabilities. Well, Johnny, first of all, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. I know Sam and I are really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Maybe to kick us off, do you mind sharing a little bit about kind of your career and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, Great to meet you and great to be here. Um, I've been at um, Granger, um, this industrial supply company, for the last just over four years. Sort of working backwards before that, I spent around 15 years at a tech consulting company called ThoughtWorks, who I actually joined in London, but they took me out to San Francisco pretty soon after that. Um, And I spent most of my time there bridging between some bigger enterprise companies, sort of retail, financial services, healthcare, some big, some of the big well-known tech companies and some interesting startups. And a large part of my role there was really trying to bridge between those. Um, and it would help startups as they were hitting architectural and um, organizational scaling points at the same time. And I used to joke that some of my work was really um, helping startups um, um, grow up and helping enterprises um, uh, kind of loosen up. Um, so h- how they can sort of, what's the sweet spot between them? In many ways, that's some of what I've been trying to do um, at Granger is get some of that technology startup culture into a large 97-year-old enterprise. Um, and before that, I had, had a bit of a background in the London startup scene with CTO of a startup, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and then had a weird background. I was self-taught because um, I'd made the strange choice to study Latin and Greek literature, language, and philosophy at, uh, at university and detoured via um, the law. But I finally found my way into computers um, um, while teaching myself while working in a pub in a good English tradition. Granger is one of these important and foundational companies to the way we all live and work, yet I'm sure much of our audience may not be familiar with Granger, which I think is why this episode is, is set up to be a really interesting one. Maybe just starting very high level, like for those who are not aware of Granger and the role it plays in the world, can you share um, a little bit about what Granger is and, and the impact that it has? So we're a 97-year-old company. We're a distributor of largely of industrial supply products. And we sell mainly into maintenance, repair, and operations organizations. And I'll really sort of simplify that by saying, largely, we sell into the basements of big buildings, whether it be an airport, a hotel, manufacturing plant, hospital. We're selling into the folks who keep that building and those operations running. In fact, the folks whose job it is, is to not be seen. Because if they're seen running around, something's going wrong. So we're trying to make sure that they're successful, whether it's making sure they've got the right um, safety supplies, the gloves, the glasses, goggles you need, whether it's the hand tools, material handling, or in some um, areas, some more complex high-end tools in sort of in pharma and so on. But our job is to make sure they have all of those products that are needed to keep their companies working. And so that ladders up to our overall mission is we keep the world working. Um, that's what we do. That's what we do as an organization. About six, just over sixteen billion dollars of revenue. Three quarters of that comes through digital channels um, that I'm largely responsible for. Wow, that's actually quite quite impressive. I didn't realize that 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 ratio. Um, I, I imagine that. Um, you know, like there's probably some some things that the outsider would naturally assume you guys are really good at. I've deployed a lot of technology, right? I'm sure like supply chain is extremely complex. But do, do you mind sharing maybe um, you know, some of the areas where you guys are using technology to you know either run the business or kind of deliver a better product service to your to your customers and clients? Maybe in some ways that you know people might not be super you know familiar, might not be obvious to others. Yeah, I can, I can, I can lay out of, um, a few of sort of historically what we've done. And weirdly, although we're 97 years old, we were founded around new technologies. Those technologies were electric motors and pumps. <laughs> um, uh, and Mr. Granger was helping people have the information they needed to work out how to repair and fix them and keep them running. Um, then through newer technologies, we were early into e-commerce, had a whole set of e-commerce sites, um, 
early into ERP. So we ended up with a lot of SAP for better or worse. Um, we were early in some of the distribution center um, automation with goods to person uh, mechanics. So there's lots of big robots and some newer robots coming into our uh, distribution centers and supply chain. Um, and now we've been leaning into more of the digital tooling, I guess, um, and really going through that um, transformation over the last five, six years. And that's a lot of what I've been driving. And that's beginning to segue into how we think about ML and AI. Um, and I might just say a couple of bits on what we're focused on. Because we've got this quite old landscape, we're trying to, as we're using our new technology, we're beginning to use more and more custom software, custom built software that we can tailor to our needs. And we're trying to focus that on areas where we think we can and should be differentiated. We sort of uh, earned the right to be uh, to have our own software there. Um, and we really focused a lot of that around um, understanding our products and understanding our customers um, really well. So we're building custom software in those areas, and I can talk a bit more about that. But so one thread is build software to drive advantage for us as a company. Other big thread is modernize all our older systems as we're going and try to do those two things at once, almost the, the walk and chew gum strategy. And to enable all of that, we're trying to grow our talent and ways of working and uh, um, and culture to make sure that that's a long-lived transformation. I think it's hard to uh, have a conversation in, in 2024 about technology transformation and not mention AI. <laughs> um, and so I uh, would love to double-click on that and, and the role that plays at Granger. But maybe before we talk about the specifics, just starting at a high level, you've been a technology leader through multiple technology waves. Like, where do you think we are in this one and the hype cycle around generative AI? Yeah, there's definitely some hype. There's definitely some hype. So teasing through that um, is interesting, but it's but there's actually a bunch of value, and we, we've got some value that we're seeing in production. Um, the sort of phrase that I've um, stolen from others um, is, I think if you look at there's a spectrum from some of the sort of breathless stuff you'll hear on Twitter or X, we'll be talking about these sort of godlike deity AIs. Um, the other end of the spectrum is you've got you've got access to a bunch of interns, and on that spectrum of deity to intern, you know we're a couple of clicks beyond you. You've got a set of interns, um, and so you can do a lot of really good stuff with semi unlimited interns. But you've got to be careful about where you apply that, the structures you put in and around it. And so that actually drives a fair amount of of how we're using it. We can talk more about that in a bit about actually looking at smaller steps in processes to apply AI to to drive improvements. And then the guardrails you'd put around it in the same way interns are very energetic, very smart, but they don't always come up with the right answers. So you need some ways of uh, um, checking their work before you push it out the door, and you need to do the same with with AI. So um, uh, that, that's that, that's one big um, area I think about. There's more to say about how the runway I think LLMs have without some other architectural pieces coming in, um, but maybe that's a future bit of the conversation. Yeah, well, I, I definitely want to get to that. But uh, Johnny, like, I really loved uh, the distillation you just had, you know, um, deities versus interns. And of, of all the ones I've heard on the show, that one really resonates with me. Uh, and I, I agree. I, I, I think many people, uh, when they start interacting with these systems, are expecting a deity. And then when it doesn't act that way, they get frustrated or they say that, uh, you know, it's just all hype and no substance. And the reality is, even if you can get really productive interns, that can be quite kind of transformational uh, to a company and to a business. So I love that framing. And then I also appreciate what you said around when you're working with interns, you've got to put guardrails and kind of break up processes to make them successful. You know, maybe just continue with that analogy. Can you connect that to some use cases and, and, and sort of like, what are the ways you've seen these interns, these AI interns be successful and have a business impact? I don't know if there's one or two examples that stand out. Yeah. And, and we did the, all the sort of standard basic stuff on the guardrails around governance and so on and picking the right partners to make sure that we, um, our data is well, well protected and, and, and so on. Um, but, um, in terms of where to use AI in that sort of intern model, we're a big, as a company, we really believe in continuous improvement. We have a lot of the sort of lean manufacturing background and that works for our, our supply chain. So a lot of our processes, we're working out how do we improve them? And you might have a multi-step process. Um, we've been looking for areas where one step in the process is quite painful or um, um, low quality, and we think may be addressable by AI. Um, so um, a cu couple of examples I, I can talk about. One, uh, for our customer intelligence, as, as new customers are coming in or they're, they're hitting certain threads, um, spend thresholds, we'll do some research on them to try to work out, are they going to be a big customer? Um, what sort of potential do they have? And based on that, we can work out how we market to them, whether we apply sellers, whether we send them one of our awesome catalogs or, or how we approach them. 
And one important step is working out what industry they're in. And it sounds surprisingly simple, but there are these industry NAICS codes, um, and it can take 20 or 30 minutes to manually go and research per company. Um, we've put in a step that seems to be working quite well now um, of have a large language model go off, do the research, come back with a recommendation of a an industry or two with a couple of bits of proof of here's the links to go check out if you if you if you don't trust us and really reducing that step from 20 or 30 minutes to two or three minutes and when you scale that out to our sort of uh, multiple millions of customers that's actually really quite quite impactful um so that's that's one small step that again you could throw a bunch of interns at and so it's similar you've got guardrails bounded around the edge of it but it has a really quite dramatic improvement um another similarish one is um, as we're taking on new customer facilities, often we'll go in and someone else will have been managing or they'll have been self-managing um, their supply room or their tool crib where they're storing all of the products that, that they want us to look after. And they'll either have um, a spreadsheet of a list of all the products with sort of weird and wonderfully named products in there, or, or we'll, have, we'll go in and sort of walk around and look at the labels. Um, and the process of trying to work out what on earth is this fastener or specifically was this tool? And you got a really sort of obscure bit of text describing it that might be really compressed, the power or the size or the color or, or the brand of that tool. Um, we'll tend to sort of throw that into systems to try to say, do we have a direct product match um, or do we have ones that are similar? We've noticed for when um, some of those strings, bits of text that we're searching on fail or get poor matches, we are now trying to expand them out with a large language model to work out actually if we span that out to this was 12 inches, whatever it was, 100 watts, um, whatever the brand is, push that back into the matching um, algorithm, we get much, much better results. And so that, that one's fairly, it seems to be working fairly well, but it's, it's a tiny little step. But we think there are so many of those potential areas all the way across the business that if we take that continuous improvement approach, understand the process, and understand the inputs and outputs, we can actually really see if we're having an impact um, or not. So those are just a cu couple of examples of where areas that are kind of behind the scenes, but um, seem a little odd, but ha actually having tangible impact for us. You've been able to kind of find some very concrete specific problems that drive some, you know, some progress forward now. I guess what, what would be your advice to, you know, some of your peers about, you know, how to, how to identify those things and how to get value out of what we have today without, you know, well, while still being mindful of the future, but without having to wait six years to like deliver an impact. I think you've got to dive in and get started. Now, I'm a big believer that in technology, the right way to approach it is you take big problems and you break them down into small problems, and then you deal with small problems one by one by one. Um, some of the arts comes in actually how you break break problems down. But we're trying to do a lot of sort of incremental small release pieces. Uh, for example, we'd be doing a lot of work um, to support our customer service um, agents. Um, and there's lots of stuff that isn't quite ready there. And we're waiting to say, hey, will some of the big vendors, will a Salesforce or SAP or someone else give us the tooling we want? But that wasn't there yet. So we wanted to get started. Um, and so we took a small set. We took um, the text channel where customers can text with uh, our customer service agents is the, is the smallest channel for us. We took a thin slice of people who are looking for product information out of that small channel and started peeling those requests off to see if we can uh, provide better information back to our customer service agents. Um, and this was, this was important for us um, to start small and we can learn and grow. It was also important to have humans in the loop there partly for the AI um, guardrails piece, but actually because of our business strategy. We operate this high-touch service model, so we try to go the extra mile to make our customers' problems go away. We're not just shipping them products in the nice red and white boxes. Our job is actually to make sure that they can keep their operations running, so we need to be one step ahead of that. We need to make sure that they never run out of the products they need. We know what they're going to need. We get it to them ahead of time. We make it easy for them to procure and, um, and interact with, um, with us. Um, and so to do that, we deploy a mixture of people, humans, our team members, and technology. And so really, we want our customers to be interacting with people first. And so we're trying to augment them with these extra powers. And what was interesting as we were beginning to spin up this LLM um, Gen AI piece to start helping with product selection is first up, we thought, well, we can just give the customer an answer and the customer service agent will push it through. But we started realizing that the right thing was to slow down and work out the right next questions to ask. So a customer says, hey, I need a drill. Um, the answer isn't, hey, we've got a drill because we've got 
thousands of, of drills. It's, okay, what's, what industry are you in? What use is it for? Um, what sort of power do you need? What sort of protections do you need? And so the, um, this, um, digital assistant was actually recommending better questions for our customer service agents. Um, so that guided the customer to, the, to good answers. Um, but also the feedback from the, from those uh, customer service agents was they loved it because it made them seem smarter because they got to un- um, ask smart questions about the product, about their industry. Um, so that was, we started small and that's been growing. It seems to be successful. That's rolled out across that channel. We're now looking at other problem areas we can look at and potentially going to other channels like sort of email or voice, but they have their own channel um, challenges that we'll need to address as we get there. That, that's a great example, I think, particularly for you guys, because the, the catalog is so big, right? You take the world's best, you know, customer server agent in the world and you put them in your organization. Like, obviously, how are they going to know about a thousand SKU or a million SKUs? Right. And so two, two, two million SKUs in our, in our main, uh, Granger brand and across the whole, um, portfolio, something like 30 million, uh, products that we're managing. So yeah, a small challenge. I like that example because I think, and there's some, there's some people who might be in your shoes who are saying, Oh, we'll just wait a couple of years. So we got the full AI thing. Right. And I like kind of the incremental approach saying, Hey, let's start with just like advising, you know, the agent, right. Giving a couple extra questions, maybe some additional information that at some point you're kind of, you know, it's a AI generated response that's just, you know, recommended and then reviewed by human. And then at some point, like, hey, 2%, we can probably just respond automatically. And you can kind of go up to, you know, kind of move up from there. But that, that seems like a very, as, you know, stealing Psalm's language, it's a very tractable approach to, you know, going on the kind of AI journey, or, you know, getting practical results, you know, along the way while also going towards like that, whatever that kind of future state is. Yeah, and I think that's one of the lessons learned as we've been doing more and more custom software delivery. And that's one of the major things I came in to help us bring a culture of of how to build our own software. And what's different there from rolling out large off-the-shelf systems, which are largely big bang, you install, buy the thing, install the thing, integrate it, and um, hope it works. With custom software, getting to these really, really small iterations, continuous delivery, well-tested, pushing out small pieces and learning about the customer feedback and the sort of resilience and scalability um, of that software at, at the same time. That mindset, that test and learn rapid mindset that we'd really sort of internalize for software delivery is really helpful as you're pushing out some of these AI systems as, um, as well, we're finding. So that that mentality and that culture was already in, in place. And so we're just leaning on that. If you think about, you know, again, this kind of AI journey we're on and, you know, Granger goes through, you know, the next 10 iterations of kind of, you know, evolving and adapting, where do you think this like ends up in like, you know, five years from now, right? What are some of the ways you see, you know, AI and machine learning and some of these new technologies kind of transforming the business in ways that, you know, maybe one of your, your customers, or the average employee or someone on the outside, you know, might not expect? We're almost like a dating site. We're dating customers with products that they need. And so we need to understand our customers and their industries, understand the products and the suppliers and how to get those together. And I think AI is just one extra tool in helping us, helping us do that. Um, we do see a virtuous cycle um, between the human efforts of researching these products, talking to the manufacturers, working out from a merchandising perspective what's most important about these products and these assortments. That actually generates better data for us. And a lot of the custom software we're building is to empower, whether it's our merchandising agents or customer intelligence people, to do their work that drives a business but spit out better data. That data then feeds into potential machine learning AI systems. We can get that into motion, get that in front of um, customers and improve that data and sort of, and, and feed it back. So, so I think we understand the sort of major, um, forces or direction we're going. And I see that being that that's not changing. Understand products, understand customers, bring them together super easily. Where AI applies in there, it's hard to see places where it doesn't apply. I think if you take this sort of um, approach, this sliced approach of looking at small steps inside existing processes that you understand well, and how can you improve um, a bunch of them? Where there are so many processes across the organization that could be improved in that way. So I think, I think we'll see a ton of those. There may well then be some of those sort of next step leaps where you realize that a whole process is maybe slightly unnecessary. You can, you can leapfrog over that. And, and that's where some of the sort of innovation or next level thinking um, comes in. And, that is actually one of the challenges or opportunities we're looking at in our um, in our technology transformation efforts is challenging ourselves and our business partners to think about how might we want to operate the business if we were unconstrained by our current technology. I mean, that's a big, big part. Um, I partner with our chief product officer, Brian Walker, and a lot of his job is to go drive that question repeatedly until until he actually gets an, an answer he likes. 
Because often people are so conditioned by the software they've been using for the last decade or so to think that's the only way to operate the business and pushing them to think differently about what do we actually want to do for the customer? What's the value that the customer gets? Get a little creative and curious about how we might do that that differently. Um, and then backing that up by building the software or training the systems that can actually support that different way of operating. So that's that's one portion of the transformation journey that we're trying to be on. I think we would all agree there's like countless examples of boundless opportunity for us to deploy these technologies. What are some of the areas like, you know, you feel a little bit more skeptical of, or you think maybe it's like overhyped or um, underestimated by, you know, the average kind of enterprise technology leader? Yeah, there's a handful of it. I'll start with sort of some of the products we're, we're seeing. Um, and so we, we see great products. We're, we're, we've been using a fair amount of the Microsoft Copilot um, tools. Excellent in some areas, but in some areas that they're not there yet. And that's just the state of the, the technology. Um, and to be honest, they're kind of priced like a product, but probably operate more like a feature. So that's, that's one of those things to sort of wait and, um, um, navigate on. But we have a good relationship with Microsoft. So we're, um, so we're, um, working through that. So, so I think those, are, those are areas where they're not as amazing as they could be. There are some use cases that are great. Summarizing large PowerPoints is excellent. I get so many of them and I can um, get a good idea of, of what's um, happening in there. Um, creating PowerPoints from a sk- sketch I've scribbled out. Um, I've struggled to make that, um, work well. Um, similarly on the software development side, we see a lot of benefits. Um, there's a lot that helps with coding. Um, there's a fair amount that actually helps upstream with um, information discovery. Um, we had a team who, as part of a hackathon, put together just a, um, a Gen AI-based, I think, um, search across um, Slack and GitHub and Jira and Confluence and uh, various other places. And you're saying, um, how does this API work? What does this error message mean? Um, what was the decision of this last architecture decision record? And it's really good at providing that information really quickly. And those are some of the slow pieces of the software engineering process. So, so there are pieces there that are great. Um, I see good demos of very small, of generating code for very small applications, but generating it for much larger applications. I think we're still a, um, a fairly long way off, um, on, on that. So I'm, um, more bearish on that. As I mentioned, the progress of large language models, I think it's beginning to, taper the benefit we get. I'm ready to be surprised by the, by the next models that come out. And I'm also a little worried about the energy usage and the sort of running out of data um, to train on, because neither of those are un, unlimited. Particularly what makes me think that maybe the design we have for large language models right now isn't the final or perfect design is the amount of power they need. Because our brains can do as much or more, and they operate on, what, 20 watts, I think, um, rather than the amounts of gigawatts that we're looking at um, investing in right now to train AI. So I think there's more advances to the architecture um, that's um, that's needed there. Um, so I'm, so I, th- I think we'll need another iteration on the architecture, some of these um, models that we're using before we really get to more interesting pieces. Yeah, so you kind, of, you kind of like implicitly made this point earlier, but like the technology is advanced pretty quickly, but the application of the technology, there's still just so much there, right? I mean, if you just froze ChatGPT4 for 10 years, Nine years from now, we've figured out new ways to kind of use this, right? It's, it's somewhat similar of like even, you know, cloud architecture, right? Cloud architecture, you know, that's been around for like 30 years at some level, right? But like even today, we're like, oh, what if you did this, right? We never thought about that approach, right? So like it is, it is interesting, like, yeah, when that kind of the core, when the core technology is, you know, evolving very quickly, like you almost don't get the time or space to really think about all the ways these things can be used. There's this old phrase in tech of choose boring technology, um, and which is great, great advice for anyone. Is actually sometimes the boring, simple technology is, is the right one. So if like 3.5 is the boring technology, maybe just actually pick that, <laughs> um, and and you could, and if that does what you need, actually at a better um, price point and a, and a better um, latency, um, then then maybe that's the one to use. Um, and actually, inter- this is an aside, but actually as we've been building out our customer service digital assistant, we've been doing some arbitrage across models because while the sort of four generation models are um, higher quality, their um, latency is, um, is, is a lot worse or more variable. And so we've actually got a couple of steps in the process and we can throw one set of things at, a, um, at an earlier model that's cheaper um, and faster and then for a more complex piece then sort of upgrade which model. And so that sort of model arbitrage even sort of AI FinOps of sort of working out how to manage the finances of which models you're using, that's going to become more and more of a thing. 
I was catching up with um, one of our partners who's the founder of Workday and, and he like, you know, has been in technology for a long time and he was just coming to me. He feels like it's the first time in 20 years that you can really have like fundamentally new types of applications because the interaction and data model looks so different with AI. Like that really resonated with me. And then I think whether it's inside an organization or outside for new companies, figuring out how to actually go do that is like the opportunity of our time. It's exciting like because that opportunity hasn't existed in a while. Yeah. And I would say the, the innovation in a vacuum of, Hey, I've got a, I've got a decent idea to put a startup and I put a thin wrapper around chat GPT. Maybe, maybe is a little thin or doesn't get traction. Um, we really believe in coupling innovation with a sort of tech innovation with some real understanding of the business problem. And so I think being able to go deep into a business domain is the key. And you couple the tech and say, actually, what's, what's a very specific problem we're trying to solve in supply chain or in marketing or in understanding our, um, our customers and, and apply it there. We've done a bunch of that on computer vision. That's now traditional AI, um, I guess. Um, but um, I think that's where the more interesting innovation happens is getting into understanding a business area and whether that's the, you know, the semantic layer or the ontology of, of that business. But I think that's, that's an area that we'll definitely see more movement on. That also the area, just from an entre- the entrepreneur pr- perspective too, like that, that's the area that seems like what way more durable as well, because anything that's, anything that's a thin layer or even a medium layer on top of ChatGPT, it's like, well, I try to be eight's going to do that, right? But if you go into these more niche kind of business problems, you know, the, the core thing there is not just like use a large language model, right? It's like, okay, like what about the hundred other data sets and the operationals that and all the human interfaces and workflows for supervision and like, you know, so it seems like that's where like the more durable opportunity is for, you know, in a technology landscape that's like changing very quickly. Yeah, and, and I think for us, we feel like we have the rest of the scaffolding of what we need for the other systems that can actually then sort of process before and after that and the, the standard work of the people and the relationships and, and so on to, to slot that into. But I, I think you were touching it just before and then on some of the sort of testing or the scoring um, of models. We've been putting a fair amount of effort into our ML ops, ML platform team. And I'm a big believer in testing and test-driven development. And we're having to rethink that for ML and, and AI. And in fact, some of the tests are really sort of data-driven scoring and coming up with what's a good scoring mechanism to work out if we're giving good answers to a search or to a, um, a chat conversation so that as you're changing models or upgrading models, you've got some notion of are you better or worse or have you done something weird? And so, so we've almost got these sort of algorithmic um, tests um, that, that we're now putting in place. So the one thing we like to do at the end of the episode is do a bit of a lightning round, just trying to get your kind of like one tweet Answers. All these questions are impossible to answer in one tweet, so just forgive us and you know, hope you'll still talk to us after, after the show. But uh, Sanjay, do you want to kick it off for us? Yeah, absolutely. So Johnny, to start on the lightning round, um, how do you think companies should measure the success of a CTO? Oh, ask my boss. <laughs> um, no, I, I'd, I'd probably break it down into there's probably three things I'd um I would, if, if you did ask my boss that he would probably say, so one, are we driving tangible value, measurable value for the business on the key strategic areas that we, that we think are in, in, important? That's one. Second one is, do we, by some measure, are we getting better? Um, in terms of effectiveness or productivity. And there's all sorts of traps of trying to measure productivity in, um, in technology, but are, are, are we getting more for what we're putting in and, and spending? And then the final one is a sort of team member one. Are our team members engaged and happy? And do they feel like this is a place they can do their best work? And I think if you're sort of doing well across those three dimensions, um, you're probably in a decent place. What's one piece of advice you wish someone told you when you first became a CTO? <laughs> um, well, I first became a CTO in, in, in the late 90s and I was a CTO of myself. And so the, the problems there were different. Um, as a CTO now, um, the... Pick which decisions you actually make. Um, so I actually think a fair amount about how decisions are made and where and when and by who they're made in an organization. And actually, one of my jobs now is to make as few decisions as possible. So I really try to design the organization so that you can push decision making down closer to the work. Now, the sort of flip side of that is people have to know when they can't make a decision, they've got to um, bring it back up. Um, and understanding how quickly, is this a, a rapid fire two-way door decision, or is this a more complex one that's better to circle that decision? Um, and then then how you make decisions visible. We use these architecture decision records so we can um, sort of broadcast decisions we're making and have people weigh in on them. But th- um, the fewer decisions I have to make, the better. Um, and in fact, maybe that's a key metric of how many decisions per day do I need to make? Um, or have I set up the organization to be good at making decisions? 
What do you think most IT leaders underestimate about the opportunity with AI? Um, the the non data science work that goes around it. So having good data, getting the data into the right places, you've still got to feed it into applications, you've got to test those applications and get them out, and um, you've got to operate them, you've got to secure them. Um, and so there's a rush to hire data scientists and ML scientists. We're decomposing actually a fair amount of the um, roles and skills around that and looking at what are some of the non-PhD dependent roles that are easier to sort of cross-skill or, um, or, or train people into. Um, so... Um, yeah, it's the tip. Of, the data science is the tip of the iceberg. There's a fair amount underwater, and there's a whole bunch of uh, skills and um, grunt work that needs to be um, needs to be done there. Some of that may be AI addressable over time, and there's some opportunities for startups to address some of that. Um, but don't underestimate the size of the iceberg under the water. So, just maybe switching gears to the more personal side, what's a book that you've read that's had a big impact on you? I was a big fan of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance because for me that was a real sort of insight into. Um, at, while I was repairing motorbikes, I saw it very much as the similar work to debug software and some of the mentality you need behind that and some of the joy of that as well. And it had a good slice of, uh, you know, good West Coast hippiness before I moved out to the West Coast. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that book as well. Um, staying on the personal side, what's an upcoming new technology, and it doesn't need to be AI related, that you're personally most excited about? Um, well, I actually love some of the robots we have in our in our distribution centers. Um, they're, they're kind of cool, and some of them have got names. Our favorite one is called Tuna, and he he runs around. But there's these little um, ro- robots um, that we like, partly because they're helping our supply chain get better, partly because robots are really cool, um, but partly because their power consumption is way lower as well. Um, and so actually, the, the sort of energy impact, we do a whole bunch um, on um, carbon neutrality and trying to improve our um, energy footprint. And these are way lower energy than some of the sort of previous um, conveyance systems we had. So, so I think it's really interesting stuff happening there. Okay, f- final question. I think we're going to have to, you know, um, we'll have to part ways soon. So um, what do you think will be true about technology's future impact in the world that most people would consider science fiction? Like looking for a kind of contrarian view, right? What do you think is going to come true that most people be like, ah, that's that sounds crazy? I think that at the last possible moment, humanity will find a way to address the climate crisis through technology. Um, I used to hope that we could sort of uh, um, all live sort of simple, um, sustainable lives, but I actually think we need some more aggressive technology and um, interventions. Um, it'll be a weird and wonderful future, but I, I think we will need to, and I think we will, and I really hope we'll be successful. All right. What a great way to end the episode um, with a note of optimism, which I share as well. So um, yeah, Johnny, really appreciate you making time to chat. Um, really le- enjoyed learning more about Granger and looking forward to chatting again soon. Thanks a lot, Johnny. Really appreciated the conversation. That was Johnny Leroy, Chief Technology Officer at Granger. Thanks for listening to the Enterprise Software Innovators Podcast. I'm Sam Motamidi, a general partner at Greylock Partners. And I'm Evan Reiser, the CEO and founder of Abnormal Security. Please be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find more great lessons from technology leaders and other enterprise software experts at enterprisesoftware.blog. This show is produced by Luke Reiser and Josh Meir. See you next time.